Now, uh, this is this ECG. You can see that this is the atrial flutter with variable blob. So, atrial flutter is the uh, as uh, I mean, just the preceding arrhythmia or just a brother of atrial fibrillation. And uh, the only peculiarity of atrial flutter is like uh, you will have more QRS complexes compared to atrial fibrillation. But it can vary uh, in rates. It can be sometimes it can be regular, regularly regular and completely regular as well. Okay. So the peculiarly you will have the flutter waves. You can see the flutter waves uh, unlike the fibrillation waves. You can delineate flutter waves clearly. This is the sore tooth waves, and you have the typical flutters and the atypical flutters. Mm? Okay, uh, so different kind of uh, flutter uh, seen. So you can. The most important thing is like uh, uh, sometimes you get get confused with a atrial flutter with a supraventricular tachycardia. So if you give okay, your diagnosis your diagnosis was wrong. You uh, diagnosed it as supraventricular tachycardia and given adenosine. You can simply see the flutter waves alone. You can see the SVT usually when it reverts, you can see an isoelectric line. Then it goes to the P wave and it uh, reverts into the normal sinus rhythm. Instead of that, when you give adenosine to the atrial flutter patient, you will get only the flutter waves and uh, it again gets back to the rapid rhythm. So the flutter, the treatment is uh, either you have to shock the patient with a very low voltage like a 50 joules with a biphasic defibrillator or you can give um, the uh, amiodron uh, infusion for a, a time and uh, usually it rewards in few hours time. So this is the flood or you can if you have nowadays actually we have the uh, abutilite uh, and uh, uh, now the sotalol is also available. You can try any of these things and you can revert an atrial flutter. But ultimately, if it's a prolonged atrial flutter, the management is as same as the atrial fibrillation. You have to anticoagulate the patient. You have to uh, uh, dc vote it uh, after a proper duration of anticoagulation. But if it's an acute episode, of course, you should you utilize the chance to revert it pharmacologically or by uh, DC shock. Now, this is a very interesting arrhythmia. I mean, I think actually, I mean, uh, some of you must have observed it, especially uh, some patients in the, uh, in the terminal rhythm. This is called TDP or tossard des d pointus. So this is otherwise called the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This, I mean, basically I'm seeing, showing these ECGs just to generate some enthusiasm for you to learn ECGs because we don't have time to get into every ECG and analyze it and uh, uh, learn it. So these ECGs will generate uh, some kind of curiosity in you. Since this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, you can see that there is an undulating rhythm and the, the ventricular complexes, each in ventricular complex is different from each other. So this is usually seen in uh, when there is a drug-related ventricular arrhythmia, especially what we call the hypokalemia can cause this kind of a prolonged acuity uh, uh, syndromes. And uh, the commonest situation is the hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So you have to, the treatment is again uh, the magnesium treatment, or you can shock this kind of a patient, or you can give IV magnesium sulfate, okay? So this is important, and you should not give amiodron, the usual drug, because amiodron is an agent which can prolong QT interval and which can precipitate torsad. So that is the importance of torsad, uh, that's the point is. So you have to give IV magnesium sulfate. So this is a common ECG. You can see that this is what you call the inverted mustache shine. So this is uh, the commonest uh, ECG change we see in patients with rheumatic heart disease who are on uh, digoxin. They come with the digoxin toxicity because as the age advances, the digoxin metabolism comes down. So if they take it in the normal range or the, if the creatinine goes up, you get the, So it's a very, you have to, every patient with a, a rheumatic heart disease on uh, digoxin, you should get an ECG. If you see this kind of a change, uh, then you have to uh, reduce the dosage of uh, digoxin. So that will save him uh, from a fatal arrhythmia. You can see the other uh, ECG here, you are again, uh, you're seeing a ST elevation in one and AVL and you have ST elevation in V6. So again, uh, I would say that, see, whenever you have a lateral MI, you it's otherwise called the posterior wall MI. So you can take the posterior leads. Instead of 
starting the ecg from v1 you can place the leads the v1 in, in the position of v4 v5 v6 and the other three leads like the normal v5 v4 v5 v6 leads you can place in the posterior axillary line then in the interscapular the the uh, interscapular line and you can uh, place in the midscapular line and the lateral line so you get the posterior ecgs and you can see this v6 st elevation will be reflected in the more ecgs so whenever you suspect a uh, uh, high lateral mi or a posterior mi you can take ecg in that way the posterior leads can be included so this is a uh, inferolateral mi that means actually i mean the culprit artery is uh, left uh, circumflex dominant left circumflex you can see the st elevation in inferior leads 23 avf and instead of st elevation you have the st depression in v1 v2 v3 which is equivalent to the st elevation in the uh, lateral leads or the posterior leads so where we look at the the rs ratio in v1 v2 v3 so th that means actually the st depression happening in an acute situation is equivalent to the st elevation happening in the posterior leads because it's a reciprocal change so this is uh, the uh, inferolateral mi that means the culprit artery is a dominant left circumflex artery it's not always the uh, uh, right coronary artery because if the right coronary artery is involved you will get an st elevation in v1 okay the right coronary artery the the lead representing the right is v1 so if you have st elevation in v1 it's more suggestive of right coronary artery if your st elevation is more in lead 2 than lead 3 it's again suggest a right coronary artery as the culprit but if the st elevation is more in lead 3 than lead 2 and you have st depression in the anterior leads the dominant left circumflex is the culprit artery okay fine i mean it's a, another topic actually how to find the culprit artery i mean but we are looking at the basics of ecg only here so this is another ecg with a uh you can again uh, look at the ecg rhythm the rate is very low whenever the rate is low you should always look at whether it is a junctional rhythm so here there is no p wave you have uh, uh the uh, p wave is not seen and there is t inversion uh you should always see that there is a uh, 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 junctional rhythm and it ischemia so you should admit the patient you should look for the biomarker and you should see whether it's a chronic uh, uh, coronary artery disease or an acute coronary artery disease this is a classical left bundle branch block so when i as i told actually bundle branch whenever the bundle branch is prolonged more than uh, two or three small boxes the qrs is prolonged now you have this particular pattern then it's a left bundle branch block that means actually the bundle branch the from the hinder, uh, bund is bundle the impulses travel down the right bundle then go to the left uh, ventricle and left bundle it river, travels in a reverse way okay so you have this kind of a particular pattern where you have a uh, kind of wide qrs positive complexes in one avl and v5 to v6 previously we used to say m pattern but m pa not necessarily there should be an m pattern only what you need is a q positive qrs complex wide qrs complex in one avl v5 v6 okay so that constitute the uh, the uh, left bundle branch block now right bundle branch block means you look at the v1 alone if v1 is uh, uh, wide and you have kind of a either a qrs complex or you sometimes you have only the r the wide r complex and a small s wave that all constitutes the right bundle branch block but it, and the t wave will be inverted so you have to look at v1 and v2 alone in the case of a right bundle branch block and uh, the uh, left bundle branch is 1 avl v5 and v6 so it it carries uh, it doesn't carry much clinical importance but it it carries importance because sometimes the arrhythmias may be may come in a patient with a bundle branch block so you what you get will be a white complex tachycardia or white complex bradycardia so it should not be treated like a ventricular tachycardia because your background rhythm itself is a wide complex rhythm it's a left lbbb or rbbb so the arrhythmias come upon this uh, wide complex so it's what you call the aberrancy aberrancy so you need not get uh, uh, panic about it you will, it looks like a ventricular tachycardia but it's a harmless arrhythmia okay right so this is uh, again uh, just for a practice actually you can see that there is a gradual prolongation of the pr interval and a drop so that means actually it's a morbid type 1 wengeback phenomenon it's a type 1 
so this is a supraventricular tachycardia one of the commonest ecgs we see with uh, tachycardia the most important thing about svt is the rate will be very regular so the rate will be like uh, it's usually 170 180 or 190 if you look at the monitor the rate will not vary much it may vary from okay 168 to 169 or 167 160 but it remains almost the same that's because of the mechanism is the av nodal re-entry it cannot vary the rate and you will have a kind of inverted p wave uh, at the end of the qrs complex which is called the pseudo s wave and v1 you will have a pseudo r wave because because of the inverted p wave so this is uh, the av nrt av nodal reentrant tachycardia so this is uh, easy to diagnose and uh, the treatment is adenosine uh, you can give a uh, adenosine uh, uh, iv bolus in a vein and immediately you will get a reversion of the arrhythmia so very harmless arrhythmia you need not get panic you can take your time and just comfort the patient so it's a av nrt so this is another uh, patient with the uh, the to, uh, inferior wall myocardial infarction we have already uh, gone through and uh, you can see that there is a uh, prolongation of the uh, gradual prolongation of the PR also and there is ST depression in the anterior leads so that means actually you have a infarction this is an, in a ventricular tachycardia now we had seen that uh, another kind of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia this is not a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia this is the a regular uh, ventricular tachycardia here the rate is you can see that the not much varies the rate is almost regular okay and you have the complexes but if you look at the each complex especially in v1 v2 and v3 each complex is morphologically different that clinches the diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia it cannot be an svt it cannot be anything else it cannot be a uh, right bundle branch block or uh, just aberrancy because you if you look at the v1 v2 v3 each complex is different that means the p wave is falling at different parts of the a different time of the uh, qrs complex so that means actually there is a complete av dissociation a complete av dissociation is a hallmark of ventricular tachycardia so whenever you see a white complex tachycardia I mean, the, the, the dictum is like you should treat it like a ventricular, uh, white complex tachycardia as a ventricular tachycardia and uh, the, you should save the patient. Even if it was a, a aberrancy, you can save the patient. But I mean, even otherwise, you can uh, cast the diagnosis just by looking at the, carefully looking at the QRS complex and where the P wave is falling. If the P wave is falling at different times in each QRS, consecutive QRS, that means there, there is a complete AV dissociation, which is a hallmark of ventricular. There are many other criteria, actually, I mean, uh, to diagnose a ventricular tachycardia. I'm not going into those, but I mean, just um, give me. This is, a, you can see that the prolonged QT. But, so when you say prolonged QT, it's easy to diagnose a prolonged QT. You look at the two RR waves. So if the T wave is ending more than half of that R wave, that means actually the QT is prolonged. Now, to calculate the exact value of the QT prolongation, you need the Bessette's formula and all. But to say there is a prolonged QT, you need to look at the end of the T wave. So if it has crossed the half of the uh, interval between two consecutive R waves or QRS complexes, that means actually the QT is prolonged. So any QT prolongation should be carefully taken and should see whether it's due to ischemia, whether it's due to drug effect. Another uh, ECG of second degree heart block, here you can see that the PR uh, interval is not prolonged, but there is some P waves without following QRS complexes. So this is a type 2 mobile, type 2 uh, second degree heart block. This is an ECG of acute pulmonary embolism. Of course, ECG is not uh, anything diagnostic of uh, acute pulmonary embolism. But classically, we say some ECG findings like S1, Q3, T3, which has only sensitivity, I mean, seen in only 10 to 15 percent of patients. Plus, the most important sign is the incomplete RBBB, or you can get this kind of an RV strain in V1, V2, V3. You can see that a kind of a ST depression, which is uh, the kind of strain change because of the sudden overload in the pressure overload in the right ventricle so the right ventricle is not able to cope up with the uh, the sudden pressure overload and it creates a kind of ischemia so that is the rv strain so this pattern is uh, suggestive of acute pulmonary embolism just for an academic exercise but i mean uh, as we know actually i mean it's not uh, uh, something i mean we diagnose by ecg 
Now, WPW syndrome is uh, very easy to diagnose. You look at the, the, the classical delta wave and very short PR interval, very short PR interval, followed by a classical upstanding uh, uh, delta wave and a kind of widening of the QRS complexes and the following T wave is inverted. Okay, so the QR is, uh, the PR interval is short, prolonged QRS, delta wave and uh, uh, the, the following T wave is inverted. So we call it as a WPW, uh, of course, uh, pattern, WPW pattern. Only when there is an arrhythmia associated with it, we call it as a WPW syndrome. This is an example of the U wave in um, hypokalemia. You can see that the QT is also prolonged in this ECG. As I told, actually, the T wave ends after the half of the QR, uh, the two QR uh, complexes. So the T wave is already prolonged. And along with that, you can see the small U waves, which is suggestive of uh, hypokalemia. You can ask for the potassium. So this is how, I mean, these are for all uh, some random ECGs.